Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by a copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Salam alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. If you look at Islamic history, you know, like all these groups that are now, you know, like uh, mostly are all Muslim, you know, they had people within their own society that hated Islam, that wanted to kill the Muslims, mm -hmm. starting with the Quraysh, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Mongols, you know, uh, they slaughtered millions of, of Muslims and then their ascendants ended up converting to Islam. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Kamala Mecca. He, he, had a, he had a really cool story about um, one uh, Muslim from sub-Saharan Africa who was, his tribe was, I, I guess, Muslim on paper, but they weren't practicing at all. So he was kind of like Mujeddid. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, you know, like he was trying to give dawah to his, his, his town of maybe like uh, 10,000 people. And they're like, don't come back here. If you come back, we'll kill you. You try to give dawah, we'll, we'll kill you. Mm -hmm. So he's like, oh, what do I do now? So he ended up going on Umrah or uh, Hajj. To, mm. you know, and, and talk to some of the, you know, like Tabi Tabiin to mm. get advice on what to do in this situation. And mm. after Hajj, he spoke to the scholar and he's like, okay, what I recommend is set up a tent uh, miles away from where your, where your village is mm. and write letters to the people in your town that mm. if they're interested in Islam, uh, these are the directions to where I'm located. Mm. Uh, so that's what he did. He went back, he set up shop at this, you know, at, at this area next to a river wrote letters to he people he knew were interested in islam to begin with mm. and five brothers ended up coming back mm. and he trained them in islam he he taught them how to hunt how to fish mm. he taught them all the basics of, of of islam and after a year he said okay i want you guys to go back to your village mm. i want you to bring back 10 more uh people who are interested in islam so mm. rinse and repeat he, they brought back 10 more people and then he trained them as well and he had to set up more tents right yeah. Mm -hmm. until he had like a set of tents mm -hmm. and eventually two years later there were about a thousand people from his tribe mm -hmm. uh who were in now what is like this kind of made up village yeah, yeah, yeah. uh who, who were all from the same tribe who would all learn islam so after a while he's like okay i think we're ready to go back now so he, they went back a thousand strong muslims mm -hmm. and because he knew that these people are not going to be able to oppress us anymore yes yes and a rival tribe actually heard about this mm -hmm. and, you know, they were just like, wow, this is pretty uh, incredible. And they ended up converting to Islam en masse. Mm -hmm. So it was like this domino effect. Yeah. And, and this, this, I, this is, this is pretty much, uh, and this has been my, my, my thinking from jump, you know, that we need our own functioning community. This is what I tell the people like all the time, all on my channels, like it's the, my, one of my most talked about topics because if you look throughout history this is just how it's been done you know mm -hmm. if you look at even from the time of the prophet muhammad say something right he didn't just mm -hmm. stay in in mecca and just be oppressed you know what i mean he orders his sahaba to go to ethiopia he himself went to medina you know what i'm saying and then he started building his communities from there you know and why can't we do the same thing you, you understand what i'm saying you know, so and we can do it, especially in Canada. I don't, I don't think it's it's that difficult. But it's just a matter of having uh, like-minded people to to get it done, right? Because it requires work and effort, right? Yeah. <laughs> and people, yeah. just some people are just not they're they're not really just willing to sacrifice that much, or if anything at all, right? So, but anyway, continue. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No. No. I, no. That I agree with all of that. Um, and uh, you know. A, a lot of this is it does the idea of you know a, a European Muslim sub community. It doesn't didn't really exist as a concept in my head, you know, for the longest time, uh, you know, because there's kind of this, you know, this this kind of idea that once you convert to Islam, especially if you're white, you're not white anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think Linda Sarsour mentioned this. She's like, oh, before I you know com you know like went full on practicing Muslim. I was just a regular white girl. Mm. It was almost like 
once you convert, it's like, you lose your like white. You're not white it's, anyway. That's it. I can understand. <laughs> are you? What, and then you're like, you? I just thinking like, black well, or white? No, I'm Muslim. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What? <laughs> so I think a lot of this comes from uh, the, the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the disunity, which a lot of Muslims believe was the cause of, uh, you know, the, the, the fall of the, of the Muslim world. So, you know, there's this kind of fear that like, you know, especially, you know, now that they're in the West, they want to be totally united and not have dissension. And they, but they go into the other extreme and trying to say, okay, we don't even have any differences. Let's just get rid of the idea of nationality altogether. Mm -hmm. You know, like, let's stop saying we're Somali. Let's stop saying we're Pakistani. Let's stop saying we're Arab. We're just all Muslim. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is every mosque is, is, is predominantly one normally is predominantly one group. So when someone converts, it's almost like, okay, like your, you know, like your culture is Muslim now, but really it's really heavily, you know, either Arab or Pakistani yeah. culture, you know? So um, what I'm saying is you have to look at it as, as like a Venn diagram, you know, we're all Muslim, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we, we were made into different uh, tribes and nations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's better to have an integrated Muslim identity where, you know, you feel happy and proud, you know, alhamdulillah to be a Muslim, but you're also a representative of your, of your tribe and, and your nation. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, I think if you do that, it'll have a lot of positive effects because uh, to your own community, it'll, it'll be a lot easier to acclimate uh, people who are interested in, in Islam. Like even my father who has a, you know, has a positive image of Islam for the first five, six years, it was, I couldn't get him to go to the mosque because it didn't feel like he didn't, it wasn't his turf. He, he just yeah. didn't feel comfortable, comfortable there. Feel comfortable, yeah. But if even if we had a small, you know, like community of European descendant converts, and we just even met, you know, at, at someone's house, you know, like uh, they would feel more comfortable coming to our place as opposed to, you know, like going to a mosque where they might, you know, like uh, not feel comfortable. And it might, might be just fear too, because you know a lot of these people, if they knew that their families was interested in Islam you know, like uh, it could have severe negative consequences and they don't even want to be seen. Like a lot of these mosques are on like busy roads. Mm -hmm. So there's always this fear in my head. Like if my family or someone I know is driving down the road and they see me coming out of a mosque or wearing a hijab, you know, they're going to tell my family and it's going to be out. So. Yeah. I mean, like, um, no, it's not as, I don't think it's, it's, it's just in his head. I think it's a, it's a real thing. Like I remember when I became, when I became Muslim, Right in Toronto, in those days there were two two masajid. It was Jami Mosque, which is downtown, and uh, Tariq Mosque. And Islamic Foundation in Scarborough was just coming up. The Islamic Foundation used to be a house, right? But now it's just this massive me masjid, right? But when we went to Tariq Mosque, it, you you felt really comfortable, like you felt like like as a Muslim because it's just like all these Muslims from all over the world just kind of working together to make this mosque work, work. And it was like brotherhood, right? And I had no issues. And like, I brought my mom to that mosque, you know, Rahimullah, Rahimullah, right? So, I, and I had no, no problems bringing her to that mosque, right? But I would have problems bringing any of my family members to the same mosque today, mm -hmm. right? The very same one, because it's not the same how it was it's clearly not the same how it was before. It's a, it's a, it's a, all these massages are, are cultural centers. Let's call them what they are. They're all cultural centers. They don't really run like, um, they're, they're, they're places of worship. Yes. But my, our people are going to be running the, the mosques. You see what I'm saying? It's not for the Muslims. Yeah. It's for the Somalians. It's for the Pakistanis. It's for, you know what I'm saying? Right, and we're going to be doing things like this, right? So if you, if that's how you're going to do things, then uh, Islamic unity is an impossibility, and it's not our fault. That ain't got nothing to do with us, right? With, with the convert, we see this happening, right? We see all the blatant uh, racism and uh, domineering of of your cultures over the people, and, and we are just reacting to what we see because we understand that if we bring our own families to your cultural centers then our families are going to have a very bad taste of islam in their mouths you understand i can i can 
me personally, I have a problem going to Tabliki Masajid because I'm black. I have experiences with these. I have like bad experiences in almost all Tabliki Masajid, right? Include not just me. Like I'm not just making this up, man. You know what I mean? I had, uh, you know, even uh, like the Quran teachers. I sent one of my kids to a uh, Quran class at one of these Masajid, right? And they had a problem with my black child because he's black and telling the the, the other Pakistani kids, don't you know, they, like like a like a legit like just blatant racism. Subhanallah. You know what I mean? Blatant racism. And then when your kids grow up, um, hating the mosque, that that's why. It's because of that stuff. Right. So now your experience is, is completely different because you're white. Right. They're just giving you the, you know, and let's be real. All these Easterners, they didn't come here to for us, for us to convert to me. They came here to to participate in white supremacy, which is why they love you, because you're a white guy. They give you, you know, all this Omar trip and <laughs> whatever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they, they, they roll out the, uh, the, the red carpet for you. But at the same time, you have to go back to your own families, right? And tell them what's going on in your life with Islam, right? And you also, like, like any other convert, you might have some baggage with you. You might have some baggage with, with whatever, you know, like the, the dunya we like, the drugs, the music, whatever it is, right? Mm. Uh, alcohol, right? And you yourself now are put in a position where you might have to make a decision between your own family members and the Muslim community and the, your own family members who know you, who raised you, and they actually, they have love for you. Of course, they love you because they know you, right? You know, they're, they're getting ready now to exile you. And if you slip, if you slip, the Muslim community is going to exile you. Hmm. You feel me? Yeah. No, it's not a sustainable model at all. Like it's, yeah. you know, like, you know, like that's why only a very, very few thin slice of converts make it out. And this is why I think, you know, because, you know, when you convert to Islam, um, a lot of them will say, oh, masha ma you guys are so much better than us. You know, mash mashallah, like, you mm -hmm. know, you know, you're praying five times a day, you're, you're uh, fasting the nawafil, you're, you know, like you're, you know, you're leaders of the community, you're so strong and, you know, I, really you're setting up that person for failure because you're only seeing him at the mosque. You don't know what's going on in their real life, but also, you know, um, what they've done, they, they, they've siphoned off, um, other people who are interested in Islam, but may not be strong enough to be practicing full time where it's so, so only the very strongest actually make it. It's like survival of the fittest. Yeah. So they only see the, the use of Estes's and the Hamza Yusuf's and the, mm. Abdul Hakim Quicks and the converts that, you know, made it out and became mashallah great scholars, but the average convert that, you know, is struggling, uh, you know, to quit drinking alcohol or stop doing drugs, maybe going through an enormous effort, but you know, these, are the, these are the many converts that slip through the cracks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, they don't see that kind of full, um, uh, story. I, I want to touch on things because I actually, you know, don't completely agree with, the idea that you know every mosque should be an umbrella mosque mm -hmm. and you know i'm actually not opposed to the cultural style mosque centers mm -hmm. um in so far that and i get they're here now i mean there's no way you can uh to try to change it in another direction and just say okay they should all be umbrella mosques is just not feasible i think um for several reasons but an alternative solution would be okay, let's, especially in these big cities like Toronto, you have uh, mosques that are run by Somalis, you have mosques that are run by Pakistanis, you have mosques that are run by Arabs. I'll give you an example. Like for Eid prayer in Toronto a couple of years ago, um, we went to the Eid prayer that was run by the, the mosque that was run by the Somali community. So the Eid prayer is like 80%, 80-90% Somalis, right? One block north of us was another mosque that was run by, a, by Pakistanis. And this is both, both, Eid prayers were out, done outside. So this, you know, because Ramadan was in the summer. So we had one park and the mosque run by Somalis, they were doing their Eid prayer. And then two, literally two blocks north, 
was a Pakistani mosque doing their Eid prayer outside, and it was 90% Pakistanis. And the Somali, you know, imam was like, you know, he was yelling at like, what we should be having one Eid. What are these brothers doing? Like they're they're not, you know, like this is why we're divided as an ummah. Mm-hmm. I just thought in my head, like, well, wouldn't a better solution to be like if, if I was the Imam, I would have said, after we're done the Eid prayer, brothers, let's walk over and then say Eid Mubarak to our Muslim brothers who are having their Eid prayer there. I mean, that I think would be a, a much better solution, more practical solution, in that you know, you have the the whole Muslim community, you have an umbrella mosque, but at the same time, you have other centers in which people can keep their culture and still be Muslim, where you have your own cuisine, you have your own culture and everything. However, these centers are also places where any Muslim can pray there, any non-Muslim can go there and learn about Islam. And that way you're having this sort of, um, you know, people can see that we are united as Muslims but also that we have diversity within the ummah. You know, and the practical, best practical example that I can give is, even though the tribes of Al-Aus and Al-Hazraj, they were united on Islam, but even on the battlefield, they had their own battle flags. Mm. And they were different tribes, but at the same time, it, it wasn't to show division, it was, it was to show the kuffar, uh, the pagans, that, wow, like these tribes who were warring against each other, you know, they, they wanted them to see that that these tribes were now united Mm -hmm. um and i think it's difficult to you know the the knee-jerk reaction for a lot of muslims say no we should all be united and all have just stand together you know like insert the stuff like you know allah loves when you know we're praying together as like a big concrete block you know um but at the same time you know you don't have to do absolutely everything together. I mean, you want to have, you want to see that diversity. And I think by trying to mash everybody together, you're not addressing the, the, the specific problems that are specific to each community converts as a whole. Also, you know, like the black Muslim community, the white Muslim community, yes, there's congruence, you know, there are things that we can all agree on and I'll work on together, but that's why I supported, you know, the black American Muslim conference, because this is important. This is the black American Muslim community has issues and problems that are specific to their subcommunity, and without hearing them out, uh, how are we supposed to address them? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the thing I have with that is that if you look at the time of the Prophet Sallam, when it came to time for the works of Ivada, mm-hmm. like the the worship, uh, they did it together. And they weren't looking at uh, nationality or color or anything like that, right? Specifically the Salat. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So when these when these Masajid now, when they become like uh, these type of uh, cultural centers, what you're actually doing now is you're making the Salat itself cultural when it should be uh, derived directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. You know what I'm So for example, you have the, uh, the Pakistanis, they, they won't say it, but the reason why they want their own specific massage is because they're pray, praying underneath the method of Abu Hanifa. So they so they say that is a cultural um, quirk, right? That's a quirk, right? And that particular thinking, that line of thinking really has nothing to do with Islam. You know, you, know, you see what I'm saying? So that's that's why these things happen. Mm. You feel me? Because even even at the time when I became Muslim again, like we were, were kind of like all praying together. Uh, uh, Muhammad Ibn Madu Wahab, for him Allah, right? When all the the Muslims used to come for Umrah and Hajj, whatever, they would have four different niches: one for the Hanafis, the Malikis, the Shafis. Yeah, and, I disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. So he oh, you're was right. the one. Continue. He is the one who, who who said, "No, we're not doing this anymore. We're praying behind one Imam." Mm. right that's that's like the that's the way it should be but again if we're gonna go in that direction we have to address these type of issues right you can't talk about no muslim unity when this is what you're coming here doing all the muslims should be together but yet at the same time you're having your tabliki masjid like how does that work i agree right? you're, you're now now you're now you what you've done is you actually made the effort to say 
this is the tabliki masjid, meaning that we are doing the way the things here and according to the way Jamaat Tablik does it. That's a cultural quirk. You know, and that's that's my issue that I have. Right? Yeah, turn- no, no, I point taken. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I point absolutely point taken. And uh, you know, Again, when it comes to the Salah, absolutely, unity is, is absolutely essential. Hmm. What I'm thinking of is, is more of a, a practical solution because if they're not going to give up their, their cultural uh, quirks, hmm. you know, we should be u- united on many on, on the ground rules uh, hmm. that, you know, that any mosque is going to be accepting of, of anybody that comes in. Hmm. You know, I'll give you an example. There's a small city in uh, Ontario called Chatham, mm. and uh, there, there, there's, there's a mosque there. It's run by the Darul Uloom, mm. and they all dress in South Asian clothing, mm. um, and the women are all wearing a cob. When mm. I don't think I've ever seen a, a sister in the mosque there, anyway. <laughs> mm. And it's in the middle of a of an all mostly white neighborhood. Mm. All of the lectures are in Urdu. Yeah, and. Uh, it's just completely, and it's boarding school, so yeah. it's completely not compatible with, you know, um, the dealing with anyone who's interested in Islam. Like the yeah. whole thing says, go away. <laughs> that's that's the that's the thing that I'm that I'm, that I'm talking about. August 1997, the cover of FEMA's emergency response to terrorism depicts the World Trade Center in crosshairs. 1999, NORAD begins conducting exercises in which hijacked airliners are flown into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. June 2000, the Department of Justice releases a terrorism manual with the World Trade Center in crosshairs. September 2000, the project for a new American century, a neoconservative think tank whose members include Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Jeb Bush, and Paul Wolfowitz, releases their report entitled Rebuilding America's Defenses. In it, they declare that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. October 24, 2000. The Pentagon conducts the first of two training exercises called Moscow, which simulate a Boeing 757 crashing into the building. April 2001. NORAD plans an exercise in which a plane is flown into the Pentagon, but is rejected as too unrealistic. June 2001, the Department of Defense initiates new instructions for military intervention in the case of a hijacking. It states that for all non-immediate responses, the Department of Defense must get permission directly from the Secretary of Defense. Attorney General John Ashcroft begins flying on charter jets for the remainder of his term due to a threat assessment by the FBI. July 4, 2001. Osama bin Laden, wanted by the United States since 1998, receives medical attention at the American Hospital in Dubai, where he is visited by a local chief of the CIA. July 24, 2001, Larry A. Silverstein, who already owned World Trade Center 7, signs a $3.2 billion, 99-year lease on the entire World Trade Center complex six weeks before 9-11. Included in the lease is a $3.5 billion insurance policy specifically covering acts of terrorism. September 6, 2001, 3,150 put options are placed on United Airlines stock. A put option is a bet that a stock will fall. That day, put options were more than four times its daily average. Bomb sniffing dogs are pulled from the World Trade Center and security guards end two weeks of 12 hour shifts. September 7, 2001, 27,294 put options are placed on Boeing stock, more than five times the daily average. September 10th, 2001, 4,516 put options are placed on American Airlines, almost 11 times its daily average. San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown receives a phone call warning him not to fly the next morning. And in Pakistan, at a military hospital, all of the urologists are replaced by a special team in order to host their guest of honor, Osama bin Laden, who is carefully escorted inside to be watched carefully and looked after. September 11, 2001. The National Reconnaissance Office in Chantilly, Virginia is preparing for an exercise in which a small corporate jet crashes into their building. 
NORAD is in the middle of a number of military exercises. The first, Vigilant Guardian, is described as an exercise that would pose an imaginary crisis to North American air defense outposts nationwide. The second, Northern Vigilance moved fighter jets to Canada and Alaska to fight off an imaginary Russian fleet. Three F-16s from Washington, D.C.'s National Guard at Andrews Air Force Base, 15 miles from the Pentagon, are flown 180 nautical miles away for a training mission in North Carolina. This left 14 fighter jets to protect the entire United States. Hi, Boston Center TMU. We have a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scram some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not 